What's going on, Rock? It is so good to be with you, friends and family. Uh, my name is Sean Patterson, and I'm a member of the teaching team here uh, with The Rock. And listen, it is uh, such an honor to you and share with you uh, on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I mean, this is a day that we commemorate uh, the descent of Holy Spirit on the apostles and the other disciples of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, as described in Acts chapter 2. Uh, it, you know, it was Peter uh, in that moment who stepped forward. And as he stepped forward, he was flanked by all the other 11 apostles. And he preached the first message, the first sermon that birthed the Christian church as an official movement. And uh, in, in so many words, this is what he said, as he addressed this crowd of thousands upon thousands of people. In so many words, this is what he said. He said, Joel prophesied it. Jesus promised it. And by his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, he's here. He's here. Fast forward 30 plus years, this same Peter, uh, an old man now, uh, the same Peter, he would sit down with pen in hand, write a letter to struggling Christians that are all across Rome. Now, we're in a series that we are calling character in the midst of crisis. Um, and we will be anchored in this letter that Peter wrote to these Christians throughout this series. Um, and so I, I just want to say this out loud as I get started. And I know Pastor forward last week and he told you guys that, you know, this is a high challenge series is what he said. OK, and so I just want to echo that this whole is a mood, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to quote my 13 year old daughter, Michaela, you know, this one just hits different. Right. And so Peter is writing to Christians who are not only suffering, uh, but they're about to suffer more. Because as Peter writes this letter, and as it begins to circulate to the Christians that are scattered throughout the provinces of Rome, uh, as this circulates, it clashes with a very significant time in history for Christians. A.D. 64. Nero, Claudius, uh, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the emperor of Rome absolutely loses his mind and begins to mercilessly torture Christians. And this is after he burns down Rome and, and uh, blames them for doing so. And so this one right here is for those of us who are on the struggle bus. Okay. Uh, this is for those of us that, you know, if, if, if this pandemic has left you in pain, uh, if you're like me and the black community and, uh, you know, you're trying to process and reconcile some of the things that are, are happening in our nation uh, right now. Uh, you're, you're trying to process, you know, the, the, the killing of, um, of, of, of Ahmad and you're trying to process the killing of Breonna Taylor and you're trying to, to process the killing of George uh, Floyd. Um, if that's you or, or, or if you're watching and you're mourning and you're suffering through maybe the death of a lost one. Uh, or, or excuse me, uh, uh, you lost someone or, or, or the loss of a job or loss of income or, or, or loss of an opportunity, or maybe you just are suffering through with the loss of your mental health during this season. I believe the words of Peter that he pens in this letter throughout the series as we go through it will be tremendously helpful to you because I'm convinced of this thoroughly, that nothing is more important than to learn how to live a life of purpose in the midst of painful adversity. Nothing is more important. And so if this is you and you logged on today, you, you know, you you went through your feed and, and you jumped on and this is not you and, and you're doing good. My prayer, even for you, is that you would uh, consider that maybe just maybe one day the words that Peter says in these words and in this letter will someday be useful to you. Amen. Let's pray as we get into this. Father, I thank you. For being our God. Lord, uh, I recognize that we are 70 plus days into uh, being asked to shelter in place in order to uh, protect ourselves from, uh, in order to, um, to avoid, to hide from this virus. Lord, there are a lot of people uh, who are hurting right now. There are a lot of people who are confused right now. There are a lot of people who uh, are really wrestling and grappling through a lot of emotions and things that are going on right now. But this I know, you have never called us as the people of God to shelter in place spiritually. Lord, over and over and over again in your word, you've said to us, do not fear. Jesus, you said to us, do not fear. I have overcome the world. 
And so we rest on that today. Lord, teach us, teach us your people how to walk in the dark. Lord, help us to glorify you and exalt you no matter what season of life we're in. Lord, encourage us by your word. Convict us by your spirit. Lord, save us by your son. Amen. Now, I believe uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 can be best understood if you cut it in half. All right. And verse 13 has the hinge word. That hinge word is therefore. All right. So everything after the word therefore in chapter 1 is a call to action. Peter is telling us to do something. But everything before therefore um, tells us the why. So we want to start there. Okay. Now, the book starts with Peter affirming their identity. And in verse one and in verse two, Peter says to them, you have been selected by God. You've been chosen by God. You are elect. All right. And in verse three, he says that since you are elect, you have been given new birth and a living hope because of a resurrected Christ. All right. Good so far. Right. But then in verse six and seven comes the challenge. I want you to hear this. This is what Peter says to them. <clears throat> Verse six, in this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter here is pairing two things together. All right. Peter is pairing first the idea of being the people of God and the idea of suffering together. And so the first challenge that comes through from Peter is that as a people of God, we have to be people who understand how to suffer triumphantly. All right. See, being a a, a child of God does not save you from or exempt you from suffering. You know, we in our 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 modern uh, culture that we live in, our Western culture, we think of suffering oftentimes. Many of us we think of suffering as a curse. Like like when we suffer, we feel like maybe, maybe we've missed God or that we sinned or, or or maybe we've fallen out of favor with God. Uh, Tim Keller, in his book uh, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, he says this: uh, Sociologists and anthropologists have analyzed and compared the various ways that cultures train its members for grief, pain, and loss. And when this comparison is done, it's often noted that our contemporary, secular, Western culture is one of the weakest and worst in history in doing so. Uh, Our own contemporary Western society gives its members no explanation for suffering and very little guidance as to how to deal with it. Uh, he, he then goes on in his book uh, to introduce us to a man named Paul Brand. Now, Paul Brand um, is a, an orthopedic surgeon who uh, basically specialized in the treatment of leprosy. All right. And he spent, though he's a, he was a, he's a British man, but he spent half of his medical practice and in, in career in India and the other half in the United States. And this is what Paul Brand said. Paul Brand said, in the United States, I encountered a society that seeks to avoid pain at all costs. Patients lived at a greater comfort, a greater comfort level than any I previously treated, but they seemed far less equipped to handle suffering and far more traumatized by it. See, uh, every culture must help its people understand and face suffering or risk loss of its credibility. Uh, If you look at uh, many of the different or the major world religions, uh, they all have an answer or at least a response to suffering. If you look at the the karmic religions, all right, the the, the religions that believe in karma and reincarnation, uh, uh, they say that if you're suffering, you're suffering for something that you did in a past life, uh, which means that there's no unjust suffering. And so if you're suffering now, you earned it, all right? Uh, It's fair, right? So you can wonder what... You can wonder what you did, uh, but, but there's really no room to wonder why it's happening. And they have a way of, of reconciling themselves somehow with that um, as a truth in a religion. You look at uh, Buddhism. Buddhism is uh, fascinating when you think about it in the context of suffering because Buddhism is a religion that was born out of a response to suffering. It is a religion that exists in order to deal with the issue of suffering. Uh, If you look at the shame and honor cultures, which some still exist around the world, the warrior cultures, um, their their meaning of life, 
the way that their culture deals with uh, suffering, it's about being strong. It's about being noble and sacrificing oneself for the good of the tribe or the family. And so suffering in that culture is an opportunity to sacrifice yourself for others. So they greet, they almost greet the days of suffering with bravery because for them it's an opportunity to be strong. But then you look at our culture, all right? The one that we live in, the Western secular culture, our culture sees no value in suffering. So, so when it comes to, to, to our lives, many of us, when we suffer, many of us, we don't know how to deal with it. And so what do we do? We avoid it, we deny it, and we despair in it. That's what we do. But Christianity says no. Peter, in his letter to these Christians, says no. Not only is suffering real and imminent, but God will use it to purify you. Right? I mean, think of Job, all right? one of the great men of scripture. Job, as he was suffering in scripture and, and we're familiar with his story of all the things that he lost and everything he went through. This is what Job said in the midst of suffering. He said, I don't know why God is doing this, but when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold, right? See, suffering and hardship is coming, all right? We will experience pain, grief, and loss as a reality. But Peter says, if your faith remains strong, uh, if your faith remains strong through trials, it, it will bring praise and glory to God. And it has a way of revealing Christ to the world. See, Paul says this to us in scripture. He says to believers, he said that we, we need to be able to comfort those with the comfort that God has comforted us with. Uh, but if, we've never, if we, we've ever never needed comfort, what does that do for us? Right? If, if I've never uh, gone through anything, what use am I? Right? And so the first thing that Peter wants us to know is that even as a child of God, suffering and pain will come into our lives. It'll come into our lives at some point. And when it does, God will use it to not only purify us and bring strong character out of it for us, uh, but, but he has a way of glorifying himself and revealing Christ to the world. Amen. Therefore, therefore, right? Verse 13, here's the call to action. See, because we believe these things to be true, this is what we need to, to, to do about it, okay? Verse 13 says this. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So Peter says to us, suffer triumphantly, but secondly, live holy. Now, now holiness, as I thought about it, it, it reminds me of my grandma's front room in her house when I was growing up. All right. Um, for me, growing up, and this is actually still true today if you go to my grandma's house, but for me, anytime you would walk into my grandma's house growing up, the first room you saw was always spotless, spotless. They didn't even want kids in there, right? The couches were, were really nice because no one could sit on them. The glass table was always clean and windexed. The jet magazines were always nicely spread out on the table. You even had a, a picture of a black Jesus on the wall and he'd be baptizing someone in the picture, but he'd have one eye on you just to make sure you don't touch nothing. Right. Like, 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 am I, am I the only one whose family had a front room? Right. Am I, am I the only one who had that? Right. Cause if your family was really bougie, okay. If your family was really extra, they would also put plastic on the couches. So no one could even think about getting the couches dirty. Amen. See, I believe uh, that a lot of us treat our relationship with God that way. I, I believe that, that many of us want to give God the front room of our lives. Never mind the rest of the house. We don't even want him going in there. We just want God to have the front room, right? But holiness is not about giving God the front room of your life. To be holy before God is to be holy gods. See, if you were to invite me over to your house, and as I came to your house and I began knocking on the door, if you were to say to me, come in, Sean, stay out, Patterson. I, I'm just telling you right now, that'd be really confusing for me. It'd be really tough. See, but many of us do that 
to Jesus. That when Jesus comes into our lives, what we say to Jesus is, come in, Savior, stay out, Lord. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's not fixing our hope completely on his grace. See, to, to be holy is to understand that when you invite Jesus into your life, you invite him in as a resident, not a tourist. Not a tourist. He wants a key to every room in the house. You know, Amy and I, we are currently in the process of buying a house. So this hits home, hits home right? This is familiar to us right now. Um, and, you know, if, if the seller had come to us during this process and said, hey, this whole house is yours, but you can never go into the garage or the master bathroom, right? We would say, right? We would say no deal. It'd be no deal, right? But if God and his glory is the aim, and if you want to see Christ revealed, then first, you've got to live holy. Or first, you've got to suffer triumphantly. Second, you've got to live holy. Give your life holy to God. All right. You guys doing all right? I can't hear you, so I hope you are. Amen. All right. There it is. There it is. Third, love well. Peter's third challenge is love well. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Love one another from the heart. See, one of the things that uh, made Christianity uh, so fascinating to me um, as I became a believer uh, was uh, that, that I saw that Jesus Christ had died for a colorful bride. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ brings together um, all of us with a variety of, of people from different backgrounds, uh, of different interests, different ages, ethnicities, races, perspectives, lifestyles, opinions, and different views. Uh, all who love one another. All who love one another. Peter said that our obedience to the truth purifies our souls for a sincere love for each other. See, one of the ways in which you know that Jesus has come into your life and that you are a born again believer is that you have the ability to, to sincerely love people, even people that you previously hated, even those people. Jesus said it this way. He said, by this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. But loving well doesn't just require sincere love. It also requires sacrificial love because Peter says this as well. He says, fervently love one another from the heart. See, we can never say that we bear one another's burdens if we never bear a burden at all. We can never say that. If loving God's people doesn't hurt or it doesn't stretch you in some way, and not always by action, but sometimes uh, by, by intellect. Sometimes it stretches you to think differently. If loving God's people uh, doesn't stretch you and it doesn't hurt sometimes, uh, then it's very possible that it doesn't cost you a whole lot. Very possible. Listen to me. There is no better evangelism tactic than sacrificial love. When people see sacrificial love, they see God. Sacrificial love is the clearest mark of a true Christian. It, it literally has the ability to change the world. It does. So what does it look like to live a life of purpose in the midst of painful adversity? Peter gives us three challenges. Number one, suffer triumphantly. Suffering is real and imminent. It will come into your life at some point. And when it does, what an opportunity it is for God to, to develop great character in you and to purify you. And not only that, to bring glory to himself and to reveal Christ to the world. The second challenge is live holy, right? Jesus does not want to be a tourist in your life. He wants to be a resident. To live holy before God is to give yourself holy to God. And lastly, love well. Because of the love with which he's loved you, sincerely love others and do something about it. Stretch yourself to love others. See, sacrificial love is an overwhelming pointer to the love of Jesus. Now, uh, Peter's words, uh, I believe, are really gripping uh, just by virtue of the fact that he was an apostle. The fact that he walked with Jesus for years, um, they have a lot of weight. Uh, but his words, to me, are more compelling 
when I know that Peter ultimately died trying to live out the words that he wrote down here. See, Peter never made it out of Nero's persecution. You know, I, I, I've always loved hip hop music. Uh, even since I was a child, I'm actually a child of the 90s. And so I had the benefit of enjoying uh, the music of Tupac and Biggie um, as I was uh, growing up. And, and, and I had the, the uh, ability to enjoy them while they were alive. Um, and, you know, if you know their story, uh, their conflict led to them, among other things, led to them being murdered. And something happened when those two died. When those two died, because their music was good before, but when those two died, it, it just flipped a switch for all of us. Their music went from uh, being really, really good to legendary. And I think the reason why is because we understood as a, as a hip hop culture, we understood that their, their lyrics were written in their blood. Right? We understood that, that, that everything they said had so much more weight. We hung on to every word they said. And so, you know, if, if the words of Tupac and Biggie are legendary, how much more for us saints are the words of Peter? Suffer triumphantly, live holy, love well. Now, how do we do this? Huh? Like, like wh where do we get the power to suffer the right way? to live the right way, and to love the right way. The power comes when you allow the Spirit of God to drive these truths deep into your heart by understanding that Jesus Christ is the conqueror in and the fulfillment of these challenges. See, Jesus Christ suffered for you. According to uh, the prophet um, Isaiah, he said that Jesus was beaten uh, beyond recognition that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities. He was then forced to carry his cross all the way throughout the city until he was ultimately nailed to it and hung from it. And all the while, Jesus never avoided it. He never denied it. He never despaired in it. Jesus Christ is the holiest person to have ever walked on the earth. All right, the Bible uh, demand, it declares um, excessively, it, it declares that Jesus was sinless. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says this, that Jesus is holy and undefiled. Right? The apostle Paul said Jesus knew no sin. The angels who, who announced his birth said that he is the holy one to be born. Pontius Pilate, who put Jesus on trial, said, I find no fault in this man. The thief who died next to Jesus on the cross he said, uh, this man did nothing wrong. That centurion who was at the base of the cross, the foot of the cross when Jesus died, said certainly this was a righteous man. Even demons, as they were being cast out by Jesus, called him the Holy One of God. Listen, Jesus Christ lived a life of representative sinlessness. Right? He gave himself over to be a slain tourist in order to become a permanent resident in your heart. Lastly, Jesus loves you. Jesus, God of the Bible, died on the cross, all in the name of love, like dying or Ross, right? Jesus loves you. And no matter what type of suffering you're going through today, and I know many of us are hurting, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening with you, no matter how much pain you're enduring, Jesus' self-sacrificial act on the cross will always be proof of how far he is willing to go to stretch himself to win you. And so if you're here today and you say, Sean, I need Jesus. I need his presence. I need his power. I need him to help me as I walk through, as I process and I reconcile uh, many losses in this season, in this time. I need him. We're going to pray. Or if you would say, Sean, I, I, I've only been giving God the front room of my life. And I now understand that if I'm going to be holy before God, I got to give myself to him wholly. Right. Or if you're here, you would say, Sean, I need God to lead me in sincere love. I need him to lead me in sacrificially loving other people. If any of those are you, I know, I know that I know, especially on a day like today, Pentecost Sunday, I know that Jesus can visit you right where you are and fulfill his word. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, 
I thank you for your people. But I, I, I pray Psalm 67 over our church right now. Lord, be gracious to us and bless us. May you make your face to shine upon us so that your ways may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. And Lord, if that means that I must suffer for a little while, again, I have nowhere better to go. Lord Jesus, knowing who you are, knowing that you suffered for me, knowing that you went to a cross unjustly and that it was my sin, that it was my cross, that it was my shame. No one understands the plight. No one understands my suffering more than you do. Lord, I know that even if I have to suffer for a little while, you will use it to bring us forth, to bring all of us forth with great character and purity. And so I pray for those among us, those who by the sound of my voice are suffering or are dealing with pain, are hurting, are confused, Lord. Visit them right now. And for those, Lord God, who recognize their need to give themselves wholly to you, would you guide them in that process as well as those who you're teaching to love? Well, we thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. God bless you guys.